there's something that I have been sitting and praying about and asking God to give me clarity on. And what that is, is reproval. He's had me reprove a couple of people and he's had me do it pretty sternly more recently. And, you know, I don't take that lightly. It's not something I take lightly. I want to make sure in all things, especially uncomfortable things, that I'm doing what God wants me to be doing. So I've sat down with him to receive that, to ask him, am I being too hard? And even found myself saying, I can go to that place, Lord. I can go to that place where I don't care anymore. That place that I did for years, you know what? If they don't want it, I'm just going to brush right over them. It's not like I'm paid more to do this. It's not like I'm paid more to reprove like I'm paid anything. Actually, I put in more heart and more resources internally to reprove. It's painful for me. And in fact, I think that sometimes it's more painful for me than it is for the people I'm reproving because so many could just take it or leave it. They don't care. If I'm reproving, I'm caring. And here's what, as I heard myself say that, as I heard myself say to him, Lord, I can go to that place where I don't care. He immediately answered me. That's not his heart. That is not his heart. I am required to be brought into a place where I know what I've been given and where I understand his heart and where my heart becomes like his heart. He bears us. He disciplines us. He reproves us. He forgives us. He's always working with us. And as long as we return to him, he will forgive. He will teach us the right way to go. As long as we repent, as long as we are actually examining ourselves and bearing the fruit of repentance, which is change, he will forgive and he will continue to invest in us. And that's what he wants me to know. We have to become holy as God is holy, which means we're going to be put in a position to do that. There is literally nothing in it for me to reprove any of you. It's not comfortable for me. I risk retaliation, rejection. I risk a lot of things. So I don't want anyone thinking that there's something in it for me. What would there be in it for me? The message I speak is hard. The reproval that I speak is hard. The majority of people don't want this. There's nothing in it for me. I speak what I speak because of him. What I am seeing is that there are those in this church who do not know consequences. They don't understand logical consequences to their behavior. I don't know why. I th I'm going to assume that you were not parented properly to understand logical consequences to your behavior. I'm going to assume that the world that we're living in right now that doesn't hold anyone accountable for their behavior anymore is reinforcing this paradigm of the Antichrist that, oh, there's no consequences. Jesus has already come and paid it all. I'm going to assume that you've been in churches that never reproved you, where as long as you were giving some sort of a financial offering, they didn't care about you. You could fly under the radar. You could provide ridiculous excuses that are going to lead you all the way to hell. But I am here to tell you that we have a father who provides logical consequences to behavior. And those consequences are severe. They're serious. And the ultimate consequence being that we die, that we forsake eternal life. We forsake the rest of eternity. For what? Cowardice in the moment? Laziness, avoidance, wickedness. We're not even going to desire the things that we desire right now in eternity. What you're working out is so very temporary and even more temporary than you think. It is such a short time that we have to get this together. It is such a short time that we have to even be reproved. The consequences of not doing that of not receiving that, of not bearing fruit in keeping with repentance is severe. It's serious. Do you think that losing your living arrangement right now or being chastised and being told the truth that your excuse is sorry, it is sad, it is inexcusable, and that you're excusing yourself out of the covenant, do you think that the consequences of hearing that language of hearing that truth, that message, and experiencing those consequences 
is more severe than losing your salvation? Do you think there might be a purpose in God having his servants speak that boldly and that truly and that courageously, risking the things that they're going to experience, rejection, persecution, retaliation, the things that they're risking in order to speak that message to you, in order to get you back on the path, in order to bring you into godly grief so that you will actually change? You think it's easy for us? It's not. I don't get paid, period. But I don't get paid more to give you that message. There's a reason why when God called Ezekiel to be a watchman that he said things like, if I give you a warning and you don't tell that person their blood's going to be on your head, why wouldn't Ezekiel give them that warning? Because it's not comfortable. Why would he say to Jeremiah, if you, are, if you don't speak the words that I put in your mouth and you're terrified of them, I will terrorize you in front of them. Why would he say that to them? Because it's not comfortable for us. There's nothing in it for us except that we've only done our duty at the end of the day. That God says, this is actually your responsibility to speak the words that I put in your mouth. To invoke the consequences that I'm commanding you to invoke. You don't get to continue to live in a place that God provided you to do his work if you're not doing his work. You don't get to bring sorry excuses And expect his servants to somehow validate you and say, yeah, okay, all right, cool. You you don't want what God's giving to you through his servants? Sure. Right. All right. I'm encouraged to see that those who are being reproved and rebuked are coming back and are not giving up. I'm glad to see that. And it makes me want to pray for you more. It makes me want to lean in for you more. But I want to explain some things to you, some attitudes that you need to be aware of. If God is disciplining you in this way, and he's having his servants discipline you in this way, it's because you haven't been listening to him. It's because he's calling you back to him. Some of you are hearing from him. And you don't treat this like, whoo, glad that's over. Back in his good graces, back in Carrie's good graces, who's Carrie? Who cares about Carrie? It doesn't matter. I'm here to serve. That's it. Don't treat it like that. Don't get lazy like you were before when you needed to be disciplined, when you needed to be corrected. There's one trumpet left, one, one trumpet left before no one is seen repenting. Do you know what that means? It means that out of what is left, a third is going to be cut off. Out of what is left, out of what remains after these, those first three trumpets, a third of the light will go out. God's spirit will leave them. If God's spirit is in you right now, if he's talking to you, if he's reproving you, if he's convicting you, you need to make sure that you're one of those ones. You need to make sure that you take that discipline seriously. And it doesn't matter if his discipline is angry, if he brings wrath, it doesn't matter what he brings to you. He's going to discipline you the way that he knows is best. That if you are an unruly calf... He's going to have to put you in bit and bridle in order to make sure that you stay. And that's not because of who he is. That is because of who you are. When Jeremiah was saying, discipline me in due measure. Don't bring your wrath. Don't bring your anger. Jeremiah was walking in the ways of the Lord. He was listening. He was following. And he still knew he was dirty. And he was petitioning God. He wasn't telling God who to be. He wasn't telling God, well, don't bring too much on me. Bring me as low as you need to bring me, Lord, in order to stay in your name. Jesus delighted in the fear of the Lord. It kept him on the path. It kept him understanding. It kept him in obedience. If what God needs to do is bring that anger and that wrath down, that's what we actually deserve. Jeremiah didn't necessarily deserve that. We do. And I have shared with you where I stepped apart from God and he disciplined me with anger. He brought major consequences on me and he caused me to experience his wrath. And why did he do that? Because you know that I don't make decisions anymore apart from him. I remember that lesson and it's important that I remember that lesson. 
You know what it means when you spoil the child? What does it mean when you have spoiled food? It means it's no longer good. It's no longer fit. He deals sternly with those he loves. And you know what? You can feel anger and you can also feel love towards someone. You can feel both. You can be angry with someone and you can also love them. Here are the attitudes that you need to be aware of. It's okay to say no to God. It's not okay to say no to God. When you hear God convicting you, when you know there's something you're supposed to be doing, you are to pray that God bring you into position, that he bring your heart into conformity with his to do his will. That's what you are to do. You are not to say no to God. You are not to avoid God's anger and wrath. Because we know that God's anger and wrath is coming on his people. That judgment has begun in God's house. It did not start with Jeremiah. God's wrath has begun in his house now. We know that from the point of Peter when he said God's judgment has begun in his house. We know that God brings wrath on his people. When the word says God's wrath is not for his people, it is talking about God's great wrath at the time of the end because there are many accounts in scripture where God's wrath is brought on his people and then he relents. You want to know about that? Read Ezekiel. Read about the Antichrist reign. Read about before God restores the temple. He does bring his wrath and don't you think that you don't deserve it because we most definitely do. Don't you think, phew, glad glad that's passed as though you don't need to bear the fruit of repentance, which is change. Don't treat God's discipline as though it's a one crisis after another that you just need to get through, that you just need to get back in his good favor, and that you don't need to learn what you've been doing and why it is that he's disciplining you like an unruly calf. You must change or you have not repented. That's why John the Baptist said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. The fruit of repentance is change. The fruit of repentance is remaining in God and fearing God. And you don't get to tell God how to deal with you. He will bring down on you what he knows is good. Your heart needs to be saying, do what you know is good, Father. Deal with me as you know is good. Bring me as low as you need to bring me because I know that you don't give more grief than is necessary, but bring me as low as you need to bring me to remain in your name. We are no one to tell God how to deal with us, to tell God how to raise his children, to tell God what we know is good. No, I'm going to say no to you this time because I know better what is good. When Jeremiah said, deal with me in due measure, not in your anger, Jeremiah was listening to the Lord. No one was going to Jeremiah and saying, you've not been fulfilling your covenant. You were set up in a place to fulfill your covenant, to serve God, and you chose to take it for yourself. You are excusing yourself right out of the covenant. That's not what Jeremiah, no one was telling Jeremiah that. Jeremiah was in communication with the Lord directly. He was hearing from the Lord directly. Jeremiah was bearing fruit in keeping with repentance because if you repent, God will restore you that you will serve him. If you speak worthy words, not worthless words, you will be his spokesman. And that's exactly what Jeremiah had been set apart to do. He was not running from God. He did not need others to tell him the word of the Lord, to rebuke and reprove them because they were not listening to the Lord. But you know who did run from the Lord? Jonah. Jonah said no to God. Jonah ran from God's ministry. Jonah ran from having to speak the words of the Lord and be his watchman. Did God deal with him in due measure? Or did he deal with Jonah in anger? Do you think that when Jonah was in the belly of that fish, that he wondered if he was going to die there? Those of you who've been rebuked, I mean, we all have. Can you think about when God has dealt with you in anger and in wrath? 
Did you not feel like you were going to die there? Well, there's a purpose in that. There's a reason for that. Because you are to fear the Lord. You are to understand that there's punishment for disobedience. You are to understand that he brings great wrath for disobedience. Read Leviticus 26. The things that he talks about that he brings on his people are intense. Leviticus 26, verse 27. If in spite of this, you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger, I will be hostile toward you, and I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. What? I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and pile your dead bodies on the lifeless forms of your idols, and I will abhor you. What? I will turn your cities into ruins and lay waste your sanctuaries, and I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. I myself will lay waste the land so that your enemies who live there will be appalled. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time that it lies desolate and you are in the country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths all the time that it lies desolate. The land will have the rest it did not have during the Sabbaths you lived in it. As for those of you who are left, I will make their hearts so fearful in the lands of their enemies that the sound of a wind-blown leaf will put them to flight. They will run as though fleeing from the sword and they will fall even though no one is pursuing them. They will stumble over one another as though fleeing from the sword, even though no one is pursuing them. So you will not be able to stand before your enemies. You will perish among the nations. The land of your enemies will devour you. Those of you who are left will waste away in the lands of their enemies because of their sins. Also because of their ancestors' sins, they will waste away. Is this not a God who brings punishment and wrath? Because the very next thing he says is, but if they will confess their sins and the sins of their ancestors, their unfaithfulness and their hostility toward me, which made me hostile toward them, so that I sent them into the land of their enemies, then when their circumcised hearts are humbled and they pay for their sin, I will remember, and they pay for their sin, and they endure his wrath. I will remember my covenant with Jacob and my covenant with Isaac and my covenant with Abraham and I will remember the land for the land will be deserted by them and will enjoy its Sabbaths while it lies desolate without them. They will pay for their sins because they rejected my laws and abhorred my decrees because they said no to God. Yet in spite of this, when they are in the land of their enemies, I will not reject them or abhor them so as to destroy them completely, breaking my covenant with them. I am the Lord, their God. Now, let me tell you something. Once this trumpet is blown, once number four is blown, no one will repent after trumpet number five. You can see that very clearly in Revelation nine. You have until trumpet number four, then the light will go out of those who have not picked this up. A third of those who have not picked this up. From that point to trumpet number five, if there is no repentance, that is it for you. That's it. But you have to understand that since trumpet number one, God has already been separating the wheat from the tares. Do you understand what a third of the land, a third of the green grass, all of that being burned up? Do you understand that there are people who will not have a chance after trumpet number four, who did not have a chance after trumpet number one? And then of that remaining, did not have a chance after trumpet number two, and then of that remaining did not have a chance after trumpet number three, and so on. By the time you get to trumpet number five, there is no more chance. The people have killed his prophets for the final last time. No more. There is a hardening that will have taken place, and there will be no opportunity to return to him. You cannot take these scriptures and think that you have until the day of the Lord and you can just say, oh, wait, here he comes. Okay, I repent for all my sins in the name of Jesus. Don't think that way. And also at this point in history, if you have discerned the things that I'm saying, and if you haven't, you shouldn't be listening to me. If you have not discerned that the things I'm saying are true, you should not be listening to me. And that goes for everybody that you're listening to. You need to bring these things back to God. 
But if you have discerned that what I'm saying is true, you have a little under two and a half years until the Antichrist rises. Do you think God will be dealing with you in due measure or do you think he will be dealing with you in wrath? Because that is wrath. You have been handed over to your enemies, just like God promised he would do. Each and every one of you, if you are in him, are going to experience wrath at that time. You are going to experience wrath by choosing that spirit for as long as you chose him. And you are going to be wearied and the power of God's holy people is going to be broken. There's no way at this point in history to avoid God's wrath, to avoid God's anger, because judgment has come on this generation. If you understand that, if you bring yourself into a position of understanding who you've been and why it is that you need to endure that in order to be purified, made spotless, and refined, you might be able to endure until the end. If you think you're exempt from it, you're going to be quite surprised when you start experiencing the hour of trial and testing that he's bringing on the entire world. And if you can't bring yourself into position to understand that that is what we deserve, and then you fall into the fool's category of cursing God because you think you were, you thought you were exempt from that. You thought you could just tell God who to be and then follow it up with in the name of Jesus. Then you will be in the category of experiencing God's great wrath and you will have forsaken eternal life. So why am I telling you these things? Because I'm willing to spare your feelings in order that you might be brought into a position to understand the, what is required for you to enter eternal life. God's people are treating his covenant as, as though it's weak, as though he is weak in this covenant. And that's not so. He is not weak. He is not a faltering God. He's not a pansy God. He's not a take it or leave it God. He requires certain things of you. And so if you think I'm being harsh, I'm no one. I'm not a person to take it up with. You need to go to him. You need to discern whether I'm from him and whether the things I'm saying are true and whether you should be receiving the rebuke that I'm providing. The rebuke that I don't really want to give but is my duty at the end of the day. And I do not say no to God. I'm encouraged that I see people coming back. Even after having been rebuked, I will not be convinced until I see the fruit of repentance. Not that I am anyone, but I'm letting you know that that is the criteria by which God also judges. There has to be change. There has to be change. If you've been running from him, that change looks like you don't run from him anymore. You remain in him. You do the work that is necessary every single day so that you do not hide your face from him and you lay yourself bare. And then you receive what he is cleaning out of you, how he is refining you, making you spotless and purifying you. You must change. You must bear fruit in keeping with repentance. That's your covenant. You must change.